Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and today we're going to go over the basics of shooting star trails. Now, we're going to shoot these a little different than most people expect. Instead of one long, continuous shot that goes on for an hour or more, we're going to shoot a bunch of 30-second exposures and then turn those exposures into star trails later on on the computer. But first, why not do one long exposure? Well, there's several reasons. First, noise becomes a huge problem on really long exposures. Second, really long exposures have much more opportunity to pick up stray ambient light. And third, you can actually choose how long your star trail is going to be in post-processing by the number of images you choose to stack. Okay, now the first step is picking a day and a time. The day part is pretty easy. You want a nice, clear, preferably moonless sky. Too much moon is going to add a lot of scattered light to your image and you won't get that nice black sky you're after. Also, make sure the forecast calls for clear all night long. Just one cloud drifting across your image is going to ruin it and you have to start over. Time of day is also critical, only because most people think you can start shooting shortly after sunset, but that's not the case. The best way to get a nice black sky and lots of stars is to sh start shooting once astronomical twilight ends, and that can be a long time after sunset. Now to figure all this out, I use the photographer's ephemeris on my iPhone and on my computer desktop, and that quickly shows me sunset, moonrise, moonset, astronomical twilight, so I always know just when to shoot. Now, also, use time of year to your advantage. I prefer cold, clear nights since the air has better clarity with no distortion from water vapor or heat dissipation or things like that. Makes for nice, crisp stars. The other reason is camera sensors tend to generate more noise as they heat up. When it's 30 below, you may have a dozen other problems, but an overheating sensor is not one of them. Okay, what about where to point the camera? For this, get to know Polaris, the North Star. You can easily locate it by looking at the pointer stars on the Big Dipper. All the stars in the northern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise around Polaris, and the closer they are to Polaris, the less they move. If Polaris is in the frame, you'll get a concentric circle of stars. If not, you'll get that cool meteor shower look. Next step is getting the camera ready. I like to set up just after sunset so I can autofocus out to infinity. Most modern lenses have a floating infinity point, so you can't just rack the focus all the way over and assume the image is going to be sharp. So autofocus before dark, and then make sure you turn off your camera's autofocus so you don't accidentally touch it when you go to take a photo. All right, time for some settings. First, make 100% sure long exposure noise reduction is shut off on your camera. If you don't disable it, the camera will process your image for the length of the exposure that you just took, and you'll end up getting large 30 second gaps in your star trails. I'd also set the camera for raw shooting in case you want to add a little noise reduction or color correction back at the computer, and that's almost always the case. Now, Put your camera on manual exposure mode and set the shutter speed for as long as you can. Most modern DSLRs are going to go to about 30 seconds. Next, open your lens to its widest aperture, that's the smallest number if you're not real familiar, and set your camera for continuous shooting. Finally, let's set the ISO. Note that this is only a place to start. If the sky is really clear, you may be able to go lower. If it's a bit hazy, you might actually want to go a little bit higher. Once it's dark enough to shoot, take a 30 second exposure and see if you like the brightness of the stars. If not, increase your ISO. Also, make sure you double check your sharpness too. You do not want to spend hours snapping blurry star trails. Ready to shoot? Now for the cool trick. Using a locking cable release, press the button and lock it in place. Since your camera is on continuous frame advanced from the previous steps, it'll take one photo after another for however long you leave the cable release locked. So, my advice, just sit back and enjoy the show while the camera does the work. Now, how long should you let it go? The longer the lens, the faster you're going to get good trails. To get a nice looking trail, I figure 30 minutes for like a normal focal length lens, 45 minutes for wide angle, and an hour for really wide stuff. But honestly, the longer the better since we can adjust the trail length pretty easily once we get back to the computer just by excluding the excess files. Okay, that's pretty much all there is to shooting, but how do you handle all these images once you have them? Well, we're going to look at that right now. Okay, now that we're back on the computer, let's go ahead and I put all these into Lightroom, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we have. Right now, this was the scene, and I did some foreground shots just so that I could blend them later, and you're going to see the final image at the end of this video. But uh, for right now, we're interested in making trails, so let's look at that. Now, as it turns out, I had some airplanes come across, so I'm going to start down with this image right down here, because I know that that one's are one, one of the first clean ones. So I'm going to go ahead and double click that. and. Uh, Go over to the develop module. Now what I would normally do here is I would look at things like white balance, I would maybe set a black point. Right now this is actually looking pretty good and I know from experience it doesn't need much um, 
much messed with as far as color. Maybe I would do something in Photoshop later. Uh, this would also be the place where if you want to adjust the exposure a little bit, make it brighter or dimmer, uh, you could do that. You, sometimes contrast can help a little bit. But actually, in this particular case, none of that applies. The only things I want to do is I'm going to add a little clarity. Now, I want, to, I want you to watch your video closely. Watch the stars. I'm going to put this all the way up to 100. You can see the stars just really come out when you add clarity. Take it away, and there, there it is back again. There's a lot of stars that come out there. Now, I'm going to zoom in so I know what I'm doing here. I don't want to put too much in there because it will generate a little bit of noise. So I'm going to just kind of back that down to about 50 or so. And that looks pretty good. I got a lot of extra stars, but not a lot of extra noise. Speaking of noise, I always do a little bit of luminance noise reduction here, so I'm going to just add a little bit of that, probably about 20, 25. Looks pretty good. All right, I think that actually about does it. Now the next trick is I need to synchronize this with the rest of the photos that I'm going to use so they all have the same exact settings. I don't want to get into Photoshop and have a bunch of different um, clarity settings and luminance noise reduction settings or if I did white balance I don't want every I don't want everything all skewed so I'm going to match these all up by synchronizing them. So my first one is this one right here and I went ahead and clicked it and I'm going to scroll down I'm going to grab a bunch of these just so that we have a nice selection to work with here and uh, click right here and all I'm going to do is hit sync settings right here and it's going to ask me, you know, what do I want to synchronize? Just make sure everything that you've adjusted is checked. The other stuff, if you didn't adjust it, probably doesn't make any difference because they're all set the same. So click synchronize and Lightroom instantly synchronizes all those different photos. Now the next step, we need to export these into a folder. I usually just put a folder on my desktop. I'm going to make a new one called Racetrack Stars. So there we go. And let's go back into Lightroom real quick and a file export and it's going to ask me what location I'm going to pick the racetrack stars folder that we just made and that's about it. I don't want it in a subfolder. I don't want to add it to catalog. None of this stuff is checked. The only thing you might want to look at is your file settings. I like to use JPEGs for this. Uh, JPEG is plenty good quality for just the straight trails, which is all I'm interested in here. Uh, Adobe RGB color space is plenty. sRGB might not have enough, but Adobe RGB will have plenty. Quality up to 100. I'm not resizing it. I'm not sharpening it. None of this stuff is checked. Just straight up, I just want those JPEGs. Going to go ahead and hit export. And it's going to start working on that. But their next step is now to take a look at these in Star Stacks, which is the program I like to use to create the star trails. So we'll take a look at that right now. Okay, now before we jump back on the computer, I want to talk to you about the program we're going to use. It's called Star Stacks, completely free, works on both Mac and Windows, and best of all, it's designed specifically for what we're doing, Star Trails. Really simple to use, great interface, and honestly, I can't believe they give it away. Let me show you how this thing works. Okay, first we just go ahead and launch our application. Okay, we go ahead and launch our application here, and I'm just going to go right over here to the settings. We're going to start with the settings. Uh, right now, the blend mode is what, they, what we call lighten, and that's the typical way star trails are done. The big problem with using the lighten blend mode is, uh, whether you're using it in Photoshop or this software or whatever, is that it tends to leave a little tiny zipper pattern in the stars. There's those little tiny itty bitty gaps there, and honestly, they probably don't really matter to most people, but this has a really cool feature called gap filling. We're going to go ahead and choose that, and then I'm going to show you how to use it after it compiles all the images. So I'm going to close our preferences out. That's really the only thing you really need to do, and I'm going to load my images. I just like to drag and drop, so I'm going to double click and open our Racetrack Stars folder we created from earlier, select all the images, and this drag and drop. They're all in there. From here, all I really need to do is press this process button, and it's going to go ahead and start building our Star Trails image. Now, the really cool thing about this is you can actually watch the image build as the program's working. So I'm going to go ahead and let it do its thing. I'm going to fast forward this for you so you don't have to endure all this, and I'll catch up to you in a second. Okay, our image is completely done at this point. It went ahead and did all the good stuff there. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at this gap filling thing. So I'm going to go ahead and click Show Threshold Overlay. And what this does is this, what you want to do is you want to select the star trails from everything else. So you want to lower this until you have just star trails and not sky. I'm going to put it all the way down and you can see what happens. It gets the whole image put up a little higher. It's still getting too much of the image. And I just keep backing that down until I'm getting just star trails. That looks like it's still getting a little bit of sky. I'm going to put it up just a little bit higher. 
and I think we have it right there. All right, that looks good, so I'm gonna uncheck that. Now I wanna go in on one-to-one one -one here at 100%, and I wanna kinda of take a look at this. I wanna show you guys this in the video too. This already has some gap filling in there, so I'm gonna take it completely out. Hopefully you can see this in the video. There is a little zipper pattern to these star trails, and it's very, very distracting. Um, especially on a large print. You wouldn't see it on web size or a small print, but if you blow this up, it's gonna be a problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put some uh, gap filling amount in here. And just like that, almost all the way over, just like that though, a lot of this is all cleaned up and taken care of. It looks much, much better. This would now print real good. Even I can even go higher. Uh, sometimes when you go higher, it actually makes it worse. So you gotta experiment with it a little bit, but uh, find a place you like and go for it. From here, uh, I just zoom back out. And basically, I'm just going to hit the save button and save the image, and I will then go into Photoshop and finish it up. Now, here's the final output image that, after I rotated the image and did all my post processing and added my foreground, here's what we ended up with right here. All right, well, that's about it. Thanks so much for watching today, and uh, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel so you always get the newest videos, and please sign up for my email newsletter. All my photography tips, tricks, reviews, all that stuff uh, gets announced in that email newsletter. So make sure you sign up. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.